Um, so uh, as you heard, I'm Nargis and this is Mike. Um, and that adorable robot was K1211. And him and his buddies are a part of the Imaginary Friends Society, which is a campaign that Mike, myself, and several of our amazing coworkers and collaborators were really fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on. Um, this, was a, uh, this was a project that was born from a lot of heart, um, a lot of passion, and a desire to help sick kids. And you know, we're so excited and so grateful to share our story with you guys today. So RPA created the um, Imaginary Friends Society for the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in North Carolina. And they are the world's largest nonprofit dedicated solely to the pediatric brain tumor community. And though they're the largest, um, they're actually really small and relatively unknown in the larger cancer philanthropy world. And that's kind of when our relationship with them started. They came to us for some pro bono help um, to do some brand positioning and create some materials that they could use to um, boost their awareness. Their brief to us was basically to write a manifesto, some taglines, and create some visual assets that they could use in their social channels. And you know, we did that, of course. We delivered that. But as we got to know the foundation um, and their people and the work that they do, we really felt like there was a bigger opportunity here, opportunity here for us to do something more meaningful, something with greater and longer lasting impact. So every three minutes, um, somewhere in the world, a child is diagnosed with cancer. And I just want to pause on that for a second. Right? One child every three minutes. Um, I have two small kids, um, as does Mike and several of our team members. We have nieces and nephews that we love, as I'm sure a lot of you in the audience do. And these numbers really, really hit us. Um, they're heartbreaking and they're staggering and it shouldn't be true. Um, but you know, we knew that we wanted to do something. It made us think, what can we do to help? What can we do to really make a difference? So we knew that um, you know, we could do what Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation asked us. We could deliver on their brief. Um, but as we got to know them, we started to understand that you know, it's a small organization. Um, and so a lot of their effort goes towards fundraising. Um, they don't really have the time or money or manpower to do everything they need to do. But a key component, a key objective of theirs is to support children and families that are um, facing a brain, uh, a cancer diagnosis. Um, so, you know, in working with them, we started to understand better what their mission was, and we realized we could create another awareness generating, another um, donation driving campaign for them. And of course, that's really important and they need that. But what we realized is, you know, every brief is an opportunity, right? And so in this brief, we saw an opportunity to help build that other side of their mission, um, to really help the kids and the families that are in the trenches that are um, facing and fighting cancer. So the Imaginary Friends Society um, wasn't born from the brief the clients gave us, it was born from the brief we gave ourselves. So helping uh, sick kids with cancer, um, that's a tall order, where do we begin? Um, well, we needed to understand what that experience was like. What's the experience like for a pediatric cancer patient? Um, so we interviewed them, we talked to survivors, we talked to their parents, uh, their doctors, nurses, medical professionals. Um, we dug into medical research and child developmental psychology. And through all of our learning, um, what we uncovered was kind of surprising. Um, it was a really glaring need. Um, there were really few resources out there that explain cancer and cancer care in a way that kids can actually understand and relate to. There's tons of cancer literature out there and there's tons of resources, but this information is complex and it's um, overwhelming and it's intimidating, right? Uh, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery, um, blood transfusions, those are things that are hard for an adult to comprehend, let alone a young child. Um, let's take an, I, we also have the old uh, planner trick in our presentation. Um, so let's take MRI for example, right? This is what the standard definition looks like. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging is a medical imaging technique that uses strong magnetic fields, magnetic field gradients, and radio waves to generate cross-sectional images of internal organs and structures. I mean, what is a magnetic field gradient? Like, I don't even know that. And even if you were to simplify that down, um, 
simplify it to try and explain it to a child, they don't really have the, um, the relative structures or a frame of reference with which to understand this. So the question becomes, is this a big deal, right? Is it critical for kids to understand this? Um, is, it, is that knowledge important? And it turns out that it is. Um, the research shows that when kids don't know what to expect, they expect the worst. And when they expect the worst, this increases fear and stress and anxiety, um, which obviously has an emotional toll, but it also has a physical toll. It impedes their healing. And the other thing we learned was that this lack of resources wasn't only impacting the kids. Their parents and caregivers told us that they felt like they didn't have the tools and language they needed to help their ch the children. Um, as you can imagine, as a parent, being faced with your child's cancer diagnosis is, you know, it's emotionally overwhelming. Your whole world collapses. But it's also incredibly taxing. Overnight, parents try and become experts in everything about cancer, cancer um, treatments, uh, terminology, so that they can help their children cope. Well, how do you explain this stuff to a kid when you don't really get it yourself, when you don't really have the tools and the language you need to help your child understand? So we took all of this learning and distilled it down to two super simple but super powerful truths, and that's what drove our strategy and our work. And the first is, when kids understand what's going on, it can actually have a positive impact on their health. Understanding <laughs> leads to confidence, and confidence reduces fear and stress and anxiety and ultimately leads to um, improved outcomes. So we knew that if we could help kids understand, we could actually help them. Um, but how do we do that? So that's the second component, which is that kids learn through tangible, relatable stories. Um, you know, from a developmental standpoint, children process information really differently than adults. It's very hard for them to digest foreign and abstract concepts. Things like, um, what is radiation and what is it doing to me? Or what is a cancer and how did it get in my body and what's happening in there? These are things that are hard for anyone to understand, but for a kid, they just don't have um, the mental structures and the information to be able to process that. They need that information communicated to them in a way that's relatable, in a, you know, through stories, through characters, in a way that they can comprehend and digest. So, you know, in the end, our strategy uh, was really clear. We knew what we needed to do. We needed to fill this gap. Um, we needed to create a resource that would explain all this complex medical information to kids in a way that they could relate to and they could understand. I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to take us through the work. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, as Nargis pointed out, um, we had a really clear jumping off point. We know what we needed to do. We needed to take this confusing, um, abstract medical information um, and translate it into something that was easy for kids to, to understand, um, to translate medical speak into kids speak. In the early days of this campaign, um, as we talked about it internally before it took shape, we sort of affectionately referred to it as Google Translate for Cancer. Um, that was sort of our shorthand. Um, but what does that mean exactly? How do you take that dull, um, often uh, stressful medical information and make that um, something that kids not only understand but actually want to see. Um, that was the challenge. Um, and for us, that started with um, tapping into what we view as, as kids' really most amazing attribute, which is um, imagination. Um, and that quickly led to the idea of imaginary friends, and specifically um, using imaginary friends as a creative device um, to deliver this information um, to kids. Um, so we started, you know, we started writing uh, scripts, um, and we actually had a chance around that time to meet with some pediatric brain tumor survivors. Um, these kids were amazing, and we talked to them about imaginary friends. Is this, is this a thing for you? Have you had these? Um, and something really interesting happened where not only did these kids have imaginary friends, um, but a lot of them created them during the um, treatment process, um, long stays in the hospital, uh, undergoing MRI scans, chemotherapy, radiation. Um, those are really lonely times, even with family and loved ones around, and those are the times that imaginary friends really came in, um, came through for these kids. Um, so this was the moment we felt like we had something really special on our hands and potentially something really powerful. And so out of that, the Imaginary Friends Society was born, um, a group of characters uh, designed to take confusing medical information um, and serve it up to kids. Um, the idea was to create a series of films. Here you go. Here's your glasses. <laughs> 
uh, a series of films um, where they would convey to kids um, all of the things, all the different facets of cancer care that they might, um, they might need to understand. Um, and we started writing scripts. Um, the goal was to create, um, as Nargis said, a resource um, that kids, uh, parents, and care providers could turn to. Um, and the, and the scripts were challenging. Um, these were the most important scripts as an agency I think we've ever written, um, given the delicate subject matter. Um, and it was interesting. As we wrote scripts, we found that they had to work in, in multiple ways, but often divergent ways. Um, so on one hand, we needed the scripts to um, distill you know, thick, um, heavy medical information, but it also had to sort of mask that ambition so kids would actually want to watch it so they didn't feel like they were in school. Um, they had to appeal to kids, but, but taking a page out of the Pixar playbook, we wanted them to appeal to adults as well and care providers so they would want to watch. Um, you know, we wanted these scripts, uh, these films to work today. Uh, we also needed this to be an enduring resource so they would work down the road. Um, and lastly, uh, from a production standpoint, we needed these, these scripts uh, we needed this campaign to be a, a singularly focused um, idea, but one that allowed for different pro bono production partners to get involved and feel like they could add something creatively. So there was enough of a canvas there. Um, as we wrote scripts, um, we wrote around topics, um, all the different topics uh, that we worked with the foundation to sort of determine um, what was most important to figure out. Um, MRIs, radiation, surgery. Um, and as we wrote the scripts, we found that we actually had more hands raised from production companies uh, than we actually had scripts. And so we would write more uh, to meet that demand. Um, and in the end, we ended up with 22, uh, 22 films, um, which are displayed in movie poster format. Um, the films debuted at an event in Los Angeles um, as, a, as a movie premiere, um, which was really exciting. It was put on by the foundation, magnetic fields, uh, imaging, picture taking. Fancy way of picture taking. Um, I think that that really sort of encapsulates what we were after in a really, uh, in a really nice and succinct way. Um, the films, uh, they all lived on a website that we built um, uh, called theimaginaryfriendsociety.com. Uh, they were also on the Pediatric Brain Tumor Foundation's YouTube channel. And we wanted to make the films really easily, uh, easily accessible for kids um, at home, but also kids um, in the hospital. Uh, you know, cancer treatment, um, as most of you know, uh, you know, requires a lot of hospital time. Kids spend a lot of time there, um, too much time. And so for those kids, um, we tried to take things a step further um, and, and tried to provide, in addition to information um, and knowledge, we wanted to provide something um, that was comforting as well. Um, this is just a, a, a video, um, there's not supposed to be sound, um, where we basically created an AR app um, that took those imaginary friend characters that the kids got to know throughout the films um, and brought them to life um, in an AR format. So uh, a kid in the hospital could bring uh, Roger and Charlie um, and Pico and Uni the Unicorn to life um, inside their hospital where these uh, characters would deliver um, lines of dialogue that would encourage them uh, during tough moments, um, which there are a lot of. Um, there was also a consumer-facing portion of the campaign. Uh, the case study that played before stole a little of my thunder here. Uh, but there was, uh, instead of asking for monetary donations, we asked for um, imaginary friend drawings. Uh, and when the submissions poured in, which was, which was terrific, um, we took those submissions and turned them into things for the kids. Um, dolls that could go into MRI machines um, that also held smartphones so they could watch the videos. Um, coloring books and journals for downtime, of which there's a lot when you're in the hospital. Um, and lastly, uh, posters where we had illustrators bring those drawings to life um, and the kids could put those up in their hospital rooms, um, which are typically pretty drab and, and boring. Um, so after the films launched, we conducted some research um, and we spoke to parents um, to, to find out exactly if the films were helping, if so, how. Um, and 96% said they helped kids, um, they helped them talk to kids about difficult issues. 85% um, said they helped kids feel less anxious and scared. 80% um, said they met a real need and that they were videos that they would recommend to others. Um, and so that was great. Um, but, but the real results um, came later. Uh, you know, one of, our, one of our goals for this campaign was always to um, get it into hospitals. Um, doing that is really difficult. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy with hospitals, especially pediatric hospitals. Um, and so while it was a goal, it was never something that we ever um, banked on. Um, but we felt, uh, we, were, we were thrilled to find out um, after the films had launched that they got adopted by a number of pediatric hospitals, leading pediatric hospitals from uh, CHLA uh, to Dana-Farber in Boston. Uh, so this was a, a tremendous moment for us uh, to know that it was actually getting into the hands of the kids who could use it the most. Um, another amazing moment happened when different countries started reaching out um, and asking that we translate the films or give them the films so they could translate them into their respective languages. Um, I think Sweden reached out first, followed by Brazil. 
um, China, um, Chile. And so we did it. We essentially open sourced the videos um, so we could hand over all those assets um, and different countries could put uh, their respective languages onto the films and make them available. Um, so I think as of now, it's being translated into 20 different languages um, and distributed across four continents. Um, I, you know, this part of the campaign, I wish I could say this was all part of the plan. Um, it wasn't. Uh, it was a really wonderfully um, unforeseen uh, part of it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, for, for both Nargis and I, um, that's sort of been this whole experience. You know, we feel very fortunate. You know, we work in advertising and we don't always have a chance to make an impact. Um, and I think for us, uh, this has been a passion project. And um, as more and more partners got involved, it really became an industry-wide passion project. Um, and uh, it, it was a tremendous experience. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you.